can play along at home if you'd like. Uh, if you go here, you'll find an HG web uh, place. You can click on files and you can download a tarball and that uh, read the install directives that should <laughs> get you there. Uh, you have any? Yes, what? What? You forgot an F and the domain is available and I'm very tempted to buy oh, it. Oh, nine run? Nine run. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna sit down, right? The option to like be up here and sit down. There we go. Yeah. So purgatorio, if you want. <coughs> this is probably everyone we're gonna get, so we might as well just go. How do I? Just a question. Yes. What's the command I want to use to start installing packages when I don't have? What distribution do you have? Yeah, that's an important question. Did you uninstall apt? <laughs> that's that's something you is possible to do. Did you just have to download apt and install the dpkg? Well, yeah. unless... You also install dpkg. <laughs> and unless you somehow remove Python from your installation. So, fun fact, old Debian, uh, which they fixed this by the way, this is like pre-7.0 uh, Debian times. Uh, so pre-7.0 or so Debian, you could apt purge, or well, was, I don't even know if they had apt, I think it was aptitude, you had to actually use aptitude. Aptitude purge, and did Python. It would delete Python in all of its dependencies. However, TM, the result was after it finished, and once you rebooted and the binaries left Linux's cache, when you started back up, app just broke. Sometimes you couldn't even get a shell because there were just startup routines that just hung or fell apart or whatever and fell over, and so you couldn't app things again. Can you just grab install media <coughs> and then just like use tar to just copy the install mediums just files over yourself. Yeah. Your file system, <laughs> isn't, isn't that and then reinstall all of your packages by force. Isn't yeah. that essentially <laughs> just what <laughs> Swagware's package management in is just like tarballs and Oh yeah, they're tarballs and then you take things and it copies those things using tar into its little magic place. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and and when you install like the core packages it just has like it literally just tars them over your root directory. Which is it fantastic. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, a, it's, <coughs> it's pretty fancy. I'm a little sick, so if you can't hear me, I'm sorry. Shall we? Sure. Are we good, Yash? Sick. All right. <coughs> so Inferno. Inferno is an operating system. We're going to talk about Inferno today. Inferno is an operating system uh, for grid and distributed computing, and it can be used for all sorts of doodads. It can be used just to run portable software, or it can be used as a front end for a toy programming language, uh, such as Limbo. <coughs> uh, a few updates. Uh, I'm plugging these here just out of courtesy. Um, the, there, there's a thread on Pizziazza. Also, there's this Pizziazza thread. Uh, it turns out the CS311 uh, pizza is still up, and I went back and dug this gem out from uh, 311 when I took it. Um, which was the called a rename <laughs> Piazza. Um, ISU CDC2 is coming up. Please sign up for it. Um, they pay us money to run it. Uh, the public grid is up. Uh, the public grid project is a mesh uh, of gridded um, systems, services, things like that, and they're actually all multiplexed over a Inferno registry, which we'll learn a little bit about today. Um, and I also provide uh, Plan 9 VPS shells, so if you want one of those, let me know. Only maybe dry house. Um, some terms and keywords to go over. Uh, there's, a, there, there's quite a few here, and this is mostly just for the aspiring reader after the fact. Um, but suffice to say that there's a few definitions that might help to be familiar with, uh, since I'll be referencing just all of these things, and the presentation might use some of these formats. You might be unfamiliar with them. Uh, the parentheses format uh, mentioned for the cat there is a manual reference format uh, found in like the Unix operating systems. Uh, it refers to the section one manual for cat. Um, this is because you can have name collisions between manuals, uh, or they are the same thing but describing different portions of a system. So NDB might be a program 
that exists in one manual section. However, the definition for what comprises an NDB database might be in a different section. <coughs> and the rest of these are just terms you'll see throughout the presentation. The slides are posted on pizza, so feel free to follow along at your leisure. Sorry, something there. Uh, there's a few different shell prompts I'm going to use. Uh, if you see one of these, this is what they correlate to. This is just an extension of the terms. Uh, Inferno uses, Inferno's uh, disk shell uses a semicolon by default. Uh, if you, did you know that 9 for it has its own like 9P installation now? My, Microsoft runs 9P. This is a real thing. This really? happened on Twitter. I, this is like a whole thing. Uh, also, it was accidental that they implemented it. No, 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 no. Uh, so, the, so originally they did say that they ran a Plan 9 server, and that was wrong. And we called them out on Twitter, and and then they were like, uh, "Well, I will, I was hoping they would say that was correct, and <laughs> I was gonna laugh a lot." Uh, but instead, they're like, "Oh no, we just serve uh, 9P, and it's supposedly to make uh, Linux resources available to the Win32 GUI stuff." Um, I, I still want to know where they got a working server implementation of 9P that runs on Linux. You, you can ask them. <laughs> <laughs> they might. It's in, it's in WSL <laughs> somewhere. Uh, so in the Windows subsystem somewhere, there's a 9P server hiding. <coughs> Does that mean they also have the Bert IO 9P client? Yeah, yeah, well? somewhere. Oh, nice. Yeah, so stuff is just hiding. Anyways, that was kind of fun. Um, so what is grid computing? Uh, grid computing is essentially the idea that you can connect multiple heterogeneous systems together uh, that can be anywhere. It could be, you could have one in Canada, you could have one in Japan, you could have one in Iowa uh, where nobody lives, and just tether them all together and do something with them. Assumingly, they share resources. How exactly they share resources or communicate or coordinate is fairly dubious and implementation specific. In this case, it is mostly concerned with the idea of Inferno instances that are connected together and communicate over the STIX protocol, which is an extension of the 9P2000 protocol. <coughs> uh, what is distributed computing? Distributed computing is, in some ways, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, distributed computing is a superset of grid computing, or grid computing is a superset of distributed computing. Uh, they're pretty uh, abstract terms, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but suffice to say that in this definition, all distributed computing is grid computing, and Distributed computing is more, not necessarily homogeneous in terms of the system composition, um, but is more oriented towards performing one task in a collective manner rather than a large number of tasks in a coordinated manner. Uh, this is to say that uh, distributed computing is perhaps more, more accurately uh, defined as like genome sequencing, where you can just have a bunch of compute nodes all tethered together sequencing like, well, the shark genome just got finished the other week. Um, the, or the great white shark genome just got finished and you can like volunteer up you can spin up a compute node anywhere volunteer it up it'll tether itself in and just do stuff at the behest of the central server so more of like a worker producer paradigm uh -huh. if you're taking 308 you'll learn all about that um, whereas grid computing is more oriented towards things that can just kind of communicate such as the public grid project where you might have a disk server you might have a shell server you might have uh, a radio and these are all just tethered together and they can all talk to each other and somehow do stuff with each other. <clears throat> so it's kind of like an IoT sort of thing? Yeah, you can, I, IoT is an extension of like the, the well, it's usually implemented with the similarity to the like grid computing paradigm. Uh, the, uh, the, the nuance of Inferno, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, is that it was in some ways uh, targeted towards a very primitive version of the early like IoT paradigm. It was designed for embedded systems that Alcatel Lucid put out, and the main reason that Styx uh, as a protocol was used, and that the Inferno internal design was used how it was, was because you could express local resources. Like, say, if you had like a smart camera or some garbage floating around, like this camera right here, if you could ran Inferno on top of it, it was theoretically possible that you express the camera as a camera device. Uh, so it could be called Cam. Who knows? Like Dev Cam or whatever. And you could take that dev cam and due to how the fact that the system is all multiplex sticks connections uh, and you can just pull those from other systems at will, uh, what you could do is serve that cam session or that cam device, the physical device driver that the kernel's using and export that wrapped in authentication. Doesn't really matter. You could do it unauthenticated if you're feeling ballsy, uh, which is what most people choose to do these days. Um, and just, stick it out there. And then any other node or any other system 
or maybe you have an aggregator where you want it to just have a big panel screen of all the different cameras, all, it, all that would have to do is reach out and mount each camera and then just somehow find a way to uh, pin them up in a way you can see. So it breaks down the, so like grid computing is oriented at like breaking down the problems into a more abstract set and Inferno's of problems, set of problems, and Inferno's goal was to further reduce the target for those problems to a very small, um, small set of problems, where all you need to do is implement the STIX protocol and some basic authentication functions, and you can interact with any resource on any system that you can form a connection to. <coughs> That's kind of what we're building up towards. Um, and going into this, this is a little less relevant for Inferno than it is for uh, Plan 9, but Inferno does have uh, what's called dynamic per process namespaces. Um, Unix systems lack these. Uh, an example in Unix is if you mount um, a certain disk drive and partition to a certain location, everyone can see that it's there. Uh, they might not be able to necessarily walk into it, but ostensibly speaking, everyone knows it's there and it's in the namespace of everyone. The only control you really have are like Unix permissions or access control lists. In say Plan 9 or Inferno, uh, if you do something like mount a disk somewhere or a serve file somewhere, that only exists in that process and for its children. Uh, no other process is able to bring that into themselves unless you explicitly export it. Uh, this is to say that physical disks or things that are in a namespace that you all share will be visible to everyone, but virtual mounted things and virtual file systems will not appear to other people unless you explicitly permit it or architect it in such a way where everyone will see it. <coughs> this can be thought of a lot like scope in a programming language, where if you have a variable uh, outside of all functions and say a C program, uh, every function can see this variable and it's the same variable to all functions. However, if the variable is in the main function, it will only be visible if you pass it to another function uh, that is explicitly passed and then those functions can see the variable that's held by the parent. <coughs> Linux's model is more of that of a global variable set. Um, so what is Inferno? Inferno is an operating system, but it's composed of a lot of distinct parts. Each of these parts is fairly interesting to talk about on their own right, uh, because they were designed so explicitly and so uh, directedly. Uh, Inferno was made by Bell Labs, uh, now Alcatel Lucent, but then now also uh, Nokia Labs, because Nokia bought them out. So really, this is, I guess, owned by Nokia at some extension, except they sold all the rights to Vita Nuova at some point after they were Alcatel Lucent. So like, who exactly owns all the paperwork is kind of a dubious thing. Um, but who cares? It's Inferno. Nobody uses it. Um, it was designed for embedded systems, originally Alcatel Lucent screen phones, uh, which is if you go far enough in the past is like those cutesy little phones with like the little OLED displays that just sit there and you push stuff on them and they do things and show you pretty little pictures, except they look like ass. Um, and so there was a strong corporate backing, uh, Rob Pike in interviews has stated that dude, there are a lot of design decisions that were made because corporate money said so. Um, so this is much more of a corporate project than a research project. Um, which inevitably kind of led to it falling over in terms of market competition because it was kept under wraps, they didn't want to sell it, and depending on who you ask, the original license to use, um, not even use, but to like see the source code, let alone redistribute it, was a million dollars um, in like the 90s. Uh, so nobody paid money for that. Um, uh, I, I think the rights to be able to redistribute it on your own was like three million dollars and this was reduced to a uh, hundred dollars for everything uh, after uh, after Alcatel Lucent let it go to Vita Nuova. Um, <coughs> Vita Nuova is basically one guy, his name is Charles Forsyth, he's a really nice guy. I've talked to him, sometimes he responds to emails, not because he doesn't like you, but because I think he just doesn't care. Uh, he's kind of old now. Uh, so I don't think he cares very much about the workings of the young peoples. Um, so Inferno was forked. Um, I have commit access to the Nineford project, and I very kindly asked the guy who sets up all the repositories if we were allowed to have a playground for Inferno stuff. And he said, sure, but we can't call it that. So we called it Purgatorio. Um, if you haven't read Dante's Inferno, all these names might be a bit confusing. Um, I recommend reading all three books. That is Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. They're all very good. Uh, Inferno is definitely the best of all of them. Paradiso is pretty bad. Um, 
But that's where all these naming schemes come from because <coughs> people like to be clever with their name stuff. Uh, how to get it? This is mostly so that if you get a copy of the slides, you can like click these links. I'm, I'm not going to click them for you. Um, Pete's a really nice guy. Uh, I've talked to him a few times on the grid and other places like IRC. Uh, there's this cute little URL. If you go to this URL, it gives you a VNC session with an on-demand Inferno instance. So you can just kind of click around and play with that. Um, that's probably the easiest way to play with it if you don't feel like committing to anything. Uh, otherwise, you can use Mercurial to clone the source tree. You can either use my Purgatorio or you can use uh, the official tree, which is actually got updated recently, so I need to like merge those changes because uh, I thought Forsyth gave up on it, but then after like eight months of inactivity, he finally kicked something in. Apparently, it's some kind of bug fix. I haven't looked at it. Um, and you can just like sudo apt install Mercurial or some shit. It doesn't really matter. Please adapt to your local um, changes. Uh, how to use it, uh, there's this cute little program called EMU. EMU is what bootstraps the uh, disk virtual machine, which is what Inferno runs on top of. Uh, this is built uh, in the Inferno source tree after you clone it. Um, so if you run install, EMU will get built, and this is the program that's like the gate gateway to the kingdom. Uh, you can use Inferno to run programs on your machine. You can run programs inside Inferno. You can run programs on a machine that is not one that you've ever seen, assuming you can get into it and EMU can use all sorts of options to how you want to start it. In general, this is how you kick off any uh, disk session. It's less of an Inferno tool so much as it is one that actually starts the uh, disk emulator. Uh, it's pretty handy. This is what it looks like after you get in, at least if you have an account named Set and you have a few things set up inside of it. So I have like a Sharon folder and a few other things <coughs> floating around. Uh, the base is a little bit more bare bones, but this is what it looks like. Slash dev is pretty cool. Everything's a file. Dev is full of files. Uh, the drivers file in dev tells you all the drivers that are loaded, so that's pretty fun. Uh, there's a JIT file, there's a user file, there's a time file. Reading the user file is the only definitive way of knowing if you're, what, is, what name is own, owning what process. So at any given time, you can just perform a read on the user file, and it tells you what user owns the currently running process, so that's pretty fun. Uh, there's also null, everyone's favorite. There's a few others hiding out in there. <coughs> Overall, the base install is pretty small. Uh, Inferno can run with as little as one megabit of memory, not byte, bit, um, which is very small. Or maybe it's mibabits. I don't know. It's it's the M and then the lowercase i and then the capital B. If somebody wants to like. Does that include like a libc underneath it, or literally on a device with one megabit of RAM? On a device with that. I think that's like a different notation for still a megabit. Think so? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's small. Uh, you have to like unload a bunch of stuff by default, but it can run. <laughs> um, which is to say, you can get a shell with that much memory, uh, which is pretty. <laughs> Can't do that with Linux, not very easily, at least. And don't need an MMU in that configuration. Yeah, it does not. Yeah, probably not. You do still get a garbage collector though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's pretty spicy. Um, so what is this? <laughs> Uh, this is a virtual machine. It's closer to the JVM than to a virtual machine like KVM or uh, VMware, or what you're usually familiar with when you run like a virtual machine. Uh, it's closer to the JVM. It is the Java virtual machine. Uh, and Inferno runs on top of disks. And anything can target disks in theory. Uh, it can target disk bytecode. There's actually a lightweight uh, disk VM implemented in Python floating around somewhere. And I believe there's a little transpiler floating around also somewhere that turns Python code into disk bytecode. I saw that once. I don't know if it really works. I just kind of like saw it on the internet. So hopefully that works. But you can make something that outputs disk byte code pretty easily. <coughs> Certainly is a lot easier than Java. Uh, what is Limbo? Limbo is a programming language. Um, Limbo is probably the language that inspired the Go programming language the most. Um, that is, if you held them side by side and kind of like let your eyes cross a little bit, they'd look pretty similar. Um, and Inferno, the Inferno operating system has compilers that run uh, on the host OS and in Inferno itself um, that output disk bytecode. Um, so a .disk file is more comparable to like a Java class file in that the disk VM can run it, um, but it's not a binary in its own right. It's just a bytecode blob. Um, Limbo is pretty nifty in that it supports modules and dynamic loading of modules. So you can. This comes out in particular, as we'll see later in the shell, uh, where in the shell things like regular expressions, which are like usually pretty heavyweight to implement in a shell, are implemented as a Limbo module. 
And what the shell does is if you want regular expressions to be a thing you have in your shell, you will load it explicitly, which is to say if you want it from the get-go, you have to add it to the init file for it to load regular expressions. Also, if you want to just get rid of the regular expression engine, you can just unload it, and then it's just something that you can't do anymore. Um, or more correctly, it's something that just doesn't exist in memory anymore. It only exists on disk if it's even there. Uh, Limbo also uses CSP concepts heavily. If you're here for after hours a bit ago, I talked about that a little bit. Uh, this is the idea of channels and communicating and synchronizing uh, processes through channels, which is a shared memory queue uh, that things can write on bi-directionally. <coughs> a little history of Limbo. Uh, that book right there is the book Drehos has right there on that chair. Um, it's a pretty good book. I'm, I'm a fan of it. I don't have a physical copy, unfortunately. Um, but the history of Limbo essentially can be summarized in it uses C syntax, it takes channels, and the idea of abstract data types from the Aleph programming language. CSP, it got channels, but like cooler. And then it drew a lot from NewSqueak and ML. You can actually play with NewSqueak. I ported it to Ninefront. Um, uh, it's a pretty fun little language. Uh, small talk. Uh, small talk probably has the most true to theory uh, CSP uh, concepts. I'm pretty sure that's new squeak. Anyways, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can play with small talk, it's pretty fun. Small talk has classes, but like not in the object way that you think about it. It has more true oop concepts floating around within it than you find in like Java. Uh, I think it is, there's, there's some, Ryan would know if he was here. It might be Rich Hickey, I'm not really sure. Um, there's some guy that has a talk where he essentially babbles about how uh, everyone has OO concepts around and the whole reason everyone hates OO is because uh, OO was done incorrectly. Uh, so if you read the original papers and the first few implementations of how people implemented OOP, they are very different from what we see today. Um, so this is a fun little history floating around there. You squeak the source of the rat posting that movie's been showing me? What word posting? Rat posting. No, that's completely unrelated. Okay. Anyways, uh, here's what Limbo looks like. Uh, it's a bit noisy, in my opinion, but it gets the job done. There's some semicolons that don't need necessarily need to be here. Um, this is pretty cool. If you've ever written Go, this is actually exactly identical to valid Go syntax. Uh, you don't need semicolon, but it could be there. Um, which is to say, if you have a variable, you can implicitly set its type, which is to say types are checked at compile time. And then it sets it equal to a variable value that's pulled out of a channel, uh, where in this case sync chan is a channel. Uh, in the CSP sense, the little arrow operator pulls values out of it. Uh, so my var will be whatever comes out of the channel at that given time. Uh, usually you combine this with concepts like switching on channels, locking on channels, and uh, synchronizing threads between each other. So you wouldn't just do this because ostensibly speaking, the scheduler could just not run whatever writes that channel at a time that would be useful. Uh, so you'd want to do some shenanigans to set it up so you pass values nicely. Um, this is a little excerpt from a uh, file that's linked in the notes of the slides on this slide, if you uh, take a peek at those. Uh, this essentially makes a, well we could talk, we, it's an abstract data type, but for all intents and purposes we can talk about it like a struct or a class. Um, named B is an abstract data type <coughs> that has contents of year, month, day, and age, <coughs> where age is a function that runs on itself and returns an integer. And day is an integer, month is a string, and year is an integer. Can you um, explain that again? Age is a function running on itself? Yeah, so like think like self, oh, like okay. methods. It's a, it's a method okay. for all intents and purposes. Um, so you would do, yeah, thank you. Uh, you would do something like, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Not exactly this, but in theory something like this for age as a function. So this is saying that it knows that there's a method implemented on it. Oh, okay. Now that I see that um, the B up there, I completely ignored the B to the left of the yep. B. That makes sense. Yep. So B is the name of the well structure as far as we're concerned. That's enough about limbo. How do these compose? Uh, this is, these are charts that I shamelessly, shamelessly stole from another presentation because I thought they were really pretty even though they're low resolution. Um, this is how, so Inferno can also run on native hardware. It is a virtual, it, the disk virtual machine is a virtual machine, but Inferno can run on bare metal. Um, so there are a few different ways that this composes. 
On the right, we see what we usually see, which is what it's hosted in the emulator, uh, which is hardware, host OS kernel, so if you're running Linux, it would be the Linux kernel, uh, all the host stuff, device drivers, and then very high up there, we get the disk virtual machine, and Limbo has its own threading system that runs on top of it. Um, Go, Go routines are derived heavily from how Limbo threads work. They are not the same kind of threads you find in a unit system, such as threads. Okay, cool, but what does Inferno run on? This is like my favorite segment of this. Um, so so, so we're, gonna, we're gonna run this back pretty hard. Um, but whatever, as long as it's not 64-bit. Uh, the reasoning for this, I've actually talked to Charles about this, is that uh, the disk virtual machine has a lot of logic hiding out in it that is just hard-coded dealing with 32-bit values for optimization. This is naughty. Uh, please never do that. Uh, th to be fair, they built this in like the 90s before, in like the early 90s, before anyone really like thought about 64-bit being the only way. Uh, what was the thing? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, but they didn't really think about it. Uh, so it would require significant modifications to the VM itself. Uh, so it hasn't happened yet. There's been a few attempts. Maybe I'll put more effort into it after I graduate. But uh, for now, it's staying not 64 bit. It can be done. It's not an impossible task. It just requires someone to actually dig through the guts of a virtual machine, which is yikes. That's hard to sell people on. Uh, I'd probably do it for money. Um, here's all the OSs it can run hosted on. Technically, this list is probably bigger, but these are all the ones that have folders pre-built for them. Uh, so all of these have pre-built uh, build chains for they running on them. Uh, Iris, Iris is pretty cool. Um, <coughs> but also, it can run on the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> but also, it can run on the Mindstorms RCX, which <laughs> I had one of these as a kid. It was really awesome. But also, hold on, I'm losing, I'm losing reception. Oh, oh. But also the Nintendo DS. That picture is stolen from Steve Slater's uh, Twitter feed. Um, but also <laughs> it can run on Android. Uh, in fact, it can completely replace Android uh, in that it will run on top of all the stuff that starts Android but before Java starts. <laughs> Which is to say it was made by Sandia National Labs, this project, to run but not Java, because they said, I don't want any Java <laughs> running on this. Yeah. Uh, so instead, they just ported Inferno and just start Inferno instead of Java. So dis runs instead of the JVM is the way you can think of that, which is pretty nifty um, in terms of connotation. But also, uh, the Marvel Kirkwood, which is the Shiva plug, it's a little smart plug, you can see it down there, and uh, the Open Moco, which is whatever the hell that is. Okay, so what's um, the Shiva plug? Is that just something you plug? Yeah, well, it's it's like a box, you know, like that's like a full computer in the little like thing. Oh, okay. But it has plugs. Okay, I was about I, to ask. I don't own one. So <laughs> like the criteria for running on, but if, if that's an actual machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can run it on that. Yeah, it, it works. I have seen the source code with my own eyes. I don't own one, but people tell me it works. So <laughs> the difference is from Plan Nine. This is the question that I will inevitably be asked on the internet all the time and it tires me out because they just aren't even remotely the same. The fact they use the 9P protocol as a mere coincidence of the people who built it, um, yeah, it's a really nice abstraction. Um, but in reality, they have basically nothing in common. Uh, they're, hmm? 9P2000 is... Oh yeah, 9P2000 is great. Microsoft uses it. How bad could it be? Docker uses it, KVM uses it, uh, fucking Kubernetes uses it. I mean, it. if you want to say 9P2000 is stick. Just with different right, which is why I, I, I'm trying to separate saying sticks and 9P2000, but really they're the same thing. <laughs> uh, sticks just has, like Dre Host says, a different authentication scheme, yeah. but they're effectively the same protocol. Um, STYX, right? Hmm? STYX, right? Ah, uh, yes, STYX. It's in the terms of the beginning of the slide set. Um, so let's get into the cool shit. Um, so everything's a file again. Uh, if you're here for my like distributed, I, I think I did like distributed competing talk. I don't really remember. Maybe it was for a different club. 
Um, but everything is a file again. It wasn't plan nine, it is again. But like for realsies this time. If you've taken a Linux a class that deals with Linux, inevitably the professor will drop and be like, you know, in Unix, everything's a file, but you know, that's pretty cool looking at you, Andrew Mining. Uh, <laughs> except that's bullshit. That's like hot garbage. This is just not true at all. Uh, and if you've ever tried to like interact with the slash dev or slash sys or slash prop trees in Linux, you will know very right and readily that it is just horse shit. Um, you can't do stuff very easily, and it's poorly documented, and it falls over very easily, and you can't just put files there. You have to go through these mountains of weird calls and weird structures. This is just horrible. It's a horrible, horrible mess. In this case, we literally, the, the kernel will only speak 9p, which is to say everything is then obligated to express itself as a 9p service if it wants to get routed through the kernel. Uh, so if you have a physical disk, and you want to look at the files on it, those files, whatever file system's on the disk doesn't matter. Yeah, it could be ht4, who the fuck knows. Um, but the kernel doesn't care. The kernel doesn't know that ext4 even exists. All it knows is that a server connected to it said, hi, hello, I'm a disk. Um, I, I have files, and it holds up a bunch of 9p files. And that's all the kernel will like give you, is the 9p files. It is up to the behest of the server. Uh, to handle whatever translation occurs. In the same way like the mouse device, the mouse is a file. The, mou the mou mouse is a file server that's loaded by the kernel. Um, it's a pound M device. And uh, this has a mouse CTL file and a mouse file. Reading the mouse file, I believe it's a 43 byte read. Uh, it gives you the current state of the mouse's position on the screen, what buttons are clicked, does a bit mask, and stuff like that. Um, and in mouse CTL, you can write to it, and that's how the mouse moves. You could just write mouse positions to it. and uh, it's just, it just, just a thing that just works. Um, so the mouse file is getting overwritten for every frame being drawn? Don't think of it as overwritten, because these aren't disk files. This is the important distinction here. Uh, th this is where like Linux takes the ball and tricks everyone um, by making them think that like these, these, these have to be like real files. It isn't so much that it's being overwritten. A file is only what the file server says it will be. So for example, how do you know a file exists? You ask. The, the something to do you type ls and it runs stat uh, if you're on Linux it does the stat system call and then you get something back what you get back in this case is at the behest of whatever the server is in this case there's a dev mouse server um, so what happens when you run ls in the mouse directory or wherever it's mounted stuff like that um, is it takes that stack call, it hands it off to the dev mouse server. The dev mouse sees the stack call and at that exact moment it can just programmatically determine what to give it back. If it doesn't like you, it can give you like ASCII art of a dick, who knows. Um, but it happens to give you the mouse and mouse CTL files. These at files, they're files in the sense that they're 9p files. For in the same way, when a write occurs, that is when you do a write call and you put byte, you want to put bytes into the file, uh, what happens is the kernel takes that call, muxes it to the dev mouse server and says, hi, uh, Bob gave me a write call of this size. And then the, it's on the behest of the server. The server has a handler uh, for write events. And it gets this write event, and it looks at who sent it, and it looks at how big it is. And it can just not write it if it wants to. Its criteria could be if the moon is at its highest zenith. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's on no obligation to treat it like a real file. In, in a real file in the sense of a disk file. So you, your bytes don't go in anywhere. Uh, the write call gets handled by the server, and those bytes could be taken and tossed into dev null, and it sends you a success and says those bytes have written. And, and that could just be what it does. Um, there's no like obligation for how it behaves. Typically, its behavior is like, pretty close to what you'd expect. Like You write files to the mouse CTL file, mouse moves. You read the mouse file, and stuff happens. And you can't read, write to the mouse file, and you can't read from the mouse CTL file. That's uh, just how it's documented to behave. There's no actual bytes being written. They aren't physical files. The file abstraction is kind of a misnomer uh, in that it is a data structure that looks like a file. And it's a data structure that looks like a tree of directories. And it's a data structure that looks like trees muxed into a greater tree. And this is how namespaces are achieved. In this way, uh, for example, slash on Linux is a physical directory, right? Like this is a real thing that exists on your disk. If you mount this disk and you run the ext4 server or whatever the fuck to like start it, slash is a real file. Yeah. Um, I'll illustrate it a bit. Um, so in Linux, slash is a real file. You have slash dev. Slash dev has to exist. If you've ever done, I highly recommend it. If you've ever done Linux from scratch, 
you will learn very right and rudely that if this directory isn't created, uh, things just fall over. Like, you, you have to make this directory. Um, which is to say, this directory has to exist on the disk, even though, in theory, everything in here is a virtual file, right? Uh, you have dev TTY. TTY is not a physical file on the disk. It's like the teletype that you're connected to, right? In theory, despite this being a directory filled with virtual files, this is a very real, very physical directory. This is where things fall over. In 9, this concept is more nuanced, where slash is actually a directory you can't put anything in. Very explicitly, you can't touch slash. If you try to make a directory in slash, the kernel goes, no. It is like mounted directory, create forbidden, gives you some big spooky error message that just says no. Um, because slash doesn't exist. Slash doesn't exist on the disk. It does, but it doesn't. Um, the slash that you see here, when you ls slash, is not the same slash that's on your disk because the slash that's on your disk is served by an arbitrary server. Okay. In this case, um, that can be mounted wherever. It's not obligated to be mounted at slash. You could have all of your files mounted at slash disk. And whatever is here is all virtual kernel mux garbage. Um, slash dev in the same way is not a real folder. It doesn't exist. Um, what has happened is, is there is actually a de dedicated dev mux that attaches itself and says to the kernel, I am located here. Things may mux on me if they want to be a device. And then every server, such as the disk server, that wants to get posted in here, the dev mouse server, uh, will attach itself to the dev mux. And then will appear in here. So you have slash dev slash mouse and slash mouse ctl. This is actually a fairly profound concept because what your interaction with the system becomes becomes a programmatic data structure that's very flexible. It's just a tree. This is just a big tree. If you're taking like 228, you've implemented these. Uh, it's not a binary tree. It's like a more. It's more like an alpha tree, a really high alpha tree. Um, but things can just attach, and like the dev is its own tree. It's just rooted at this place on this tree, um, and they're all just interconnected. And the whole idea of dynamic namespaces is that you can perform arbitrary transformations on this. So if you want a dev to not be where dev is for your process and no one else, you can just rebind dev to, I don't know, slash duck. Doesn't really matter. Um, but for that process and all of its children, dev is now duck. And this is the word, and this is the Lord's word, and this is law. Um, and, it, and no one else sees this. Every other process is untouched by this because this is just a data structure. It's just virtual. It's their perspective. Uh, whereas on Linux, if you rename dev to duck, I bet just everything <laughs> is just going to fall over because it's a real physical file. Um, so this is a fairly profound concept. I'm sorry I was a little long-winded, but like this is it, it's very important to understanding how this works because if we take like a mouse device from one inferno box and give it to another, that that's the same mouse device and it can mount it and it can put it and it could actually put it in slash dev slash mouse over its own uh, in that each directory is a linked list of files and it can prepend itself in this linked list and say this is now the first mouse and it look when you look for mouse it looks for the first mouse in the list pulls that one out and then performs operations on it uh, there's actually a program that I showcase later um, called DMWM uh, in Inferno where you run a window manager named DMWM and it posts itself on a port and any other inferno you want can attach itself to this using DM view and it has to authenticate naturally so you need some kind of authentication scheme set up um, but once you authenticate it takes that WM and puts it over yours in that your screen becomes their screen they're the same they're the same data structures just pinned into different places so when somebody moves that mouse and you move your mouse, you see the movement the same way on all of them. It's kind of frustrating in some ways, but you could just not export the mouse function. And then all they get is the visual screen function. And then all they get to do is look. They don't get to touch. So implementing something like a remote desktop protocol becomes as simple as just handing off the screen uh, value tree and just handing that to someone else and then saying, you can only look, no touch. And then bam, you've got like a remote desktop protocol. But like. Nobody needs to implement anything. They can just use the tools that are already found within the system. Uh, this is where the power of composition of things like Inferno comes from, is because since all of the Infernos do the same stuff in different places, they can grid together really easily by just muxing resources in this way. Um, oh boy. I did a new talk for a little bit too long. It's probably locked. Yeah, there we go. Anyways.
Um, so everything's a file again. Everything speaks in sticks. Everything, uh, Inferno manages a registry. A uh, registry is just a list of services. You can have multiple registries. Everyone can have their own registry. Uh, the public grid project has a registry that all the grid services are posted in. Moody has a radio posted into it. Um, so when you attach to it, you, can ju you could just iterate through the registry and say, I am mounting all of these services. And I am putting them all in mount slash grid slash service state or whatever. And to there they will go. Um, assuming the registry is up to date. Uh, and since I believe you need to actually maintain a connection for the registry to not get stale, um, in theory it's correct. And anyone can throw up a registry and have as many of them as you want. Um, and there's registries for permissions, there's registries for who owns what, there's registries for access and things like that. Um, network connections are files. There's a slash net, slash net folder. Uh, this is how stuff happens. You want to write to a TCP connection, you write to a file on slash net, slash TCP. Um, this is what sticks um, payloads look like. It's a binary protocol, usually transported over TCP or a socket. More cool shit. File, uh, like we, this is basically all the stuff I just reviewed. Uh, files can be exported, shared, authenticated for use. Inferno instances can mux each other. Inferno instances can run on anything TM. Uh, it doesn't really care what it's running on. Uh, so you get meta programming with meta abstractions. You, you get the ability to use the abstractions that exist all the way up the stack um, without really any cost. Uh, cool namespace shenanigans. I stole this from a book. Um, you can mount a network. It dials onto the network. I believe TCP by default you can specify. Goes to that IP address and goes to that directory on the remote resource. Um, or it mounts that on, well, you can give it a directory, but it mounts at slash n slash remote. You can then bind appending, which if you remember when we talked about the linked list of directories, this appends it to the end of the linked list, so closer to the tail. Um, which makes it lower priority for lookups. Um, slash n slash remote slash prog to slash n slash prog, where prog is like the proc tree. This is where all the processes live. Um, the result is, is if you if you run like ps after this, you will actually see your and all of the remote processes listed out. Um, in a more profound manner, this lets you, since processes are a file system, and the only way to interact with processes is through the file system, this means that by acquiring someone else's um, process tree. You can do whatever you want to them. You can kill them. You can like check their status. You can make new ones. You can do whatever the hell you want. Um, the tree is yours. If you give read-only access, then maybe you can only just list them and see who's running what, uh, what load they express, etc. Um, due to how this works, this also means that if you have a crash process, rather than make a core dump file, uh, which is what happens on most Unix, and uh, they actually uh, go into a broken state in the process tree and get snapshotted and the snapshot, you can actually debug that. So you can attach a debugger to it and start debugging the process. Uh, if you are here for my debugging talk last semester, you saw me use ACID to do something similar. Um, yeah, or PS. Uh, cool shell features. Since the shell is a limbo program, and limbo programs have modules, and modules can be dynamically loaded and unloaded, like I discussed originally, you can just load and unload features from the shell which may include regular expressions. It could include the ability to have functions. You just take sh shell functions out of your shell. You could take loops out of your shell, who knows? Um, anything that's compacted into a module, uh, you can remove by name of said module. There's a cute little list floating around somewhere in slash APPL, um, I believe it is, of all the stuff that's loaded by default. Uh, Purgatorio loads more stuff than the default Inferno tree uh, because I want to be able to use the network out of the tin. Uh, among other things, and so a bunch of stuff is loaded in Purgatorio, uh, but you barely notice because it still sits at like under 100 megabytes of usage, um, looking at you, Electron. Uh, and yeah, Limbo, these Limbo modules live wherever they want, slash dis is usually where you put bytecode by default, and there's an sh folder, uh, which is where all of the shell Inferno stuff is hidden, or shell module stuff is hidden. Um, some connotations from this. Uh, you write programs once, you can use them many times. You can just stuff it in an inferno and take that inferno and put it somewhere else. You can take the, that inferno and build it and run it on Windows. You can run it on Linux. You can run it also on just inferno, on bare metal, on a Raspberry Pi, who the fuck knows? Um, and you get all the benefits of all these abstractions and they just float around and be there. Uh, it, it gives you the ability to just use abstractions with basically no cost. Uh, here's some highlights from the software suite that ship um, the OS command lets you run commands on the host operating system. So if, for example, you say I want to run, I don't know, toilet, and you don't want to install toilet, and you just don't have a port of toilet to Inferno, you can just run OS toilet, and it just, you can just do that. 
and you can nest that however you want. So you can like pipe things into OS and whatnot. Uh, so it lets you use external commands. If you're hosting it on an OS like Plan 9, this in theory means that even with access as little as farther down here, the pound U driver, which mounts the host file system, uh, you could manipulate the host OS in whatever manner you wanted. Uh, this also means if you run it, you can choose what it can see on the host OS, so you could just deny it access if you really want. Uh, so if you're worried about it spying on you, just take that out. You just unplug that module, and it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, there's Collab, which is like a little whiteboard. It has a chat, it has a poll system. All these little programs, you can mesh them together between different instances of Inferno nodes. So you can make a little whiteboard program that you and all your friends can run, make blobs for different distributions, and they all just connect to each other over a common transport. Um, and you just do that all by just using the built-in tools. DM view, which I already talked about. Um, WN is the default window manager. You don't actually need to run a window manager. That's pretty cool. Um, due to how the graphic system works, uh, if you just run a GUI program, at least on hosted Inferno, uh, it'll just use the host uh, window and stack to host the windows for it. Uh, so you don't even need to run a window manager if it's hosted. So there's no like sub-window that needs to exist necessarily. In the same way, native Inferno can just run without starting a window manager, and you can just run GUI programs, and it'll just pull up the draw stack and uh, put it, place the draw stack under it, since drawing is separable from the window management. Uh, Spree is distributed active sessions. Um, you can read the manual if you want to learn more about it. Basically, it's a distributing operating uh, infrastructure. There's the registry, which we talked about a bit. Uh, there's software to build grids of Inferno instances. Uh, if you just type man grid, you get a bunch of stuff for that. Uh, and then there's slash net, which is pretty cool, where all your network connections live. And they live as files. If you want to close it, you just RM the directory. Because if you delete it, the connection doesn't exist anymore. This is a thing you could do. If you just want a connection to go away and you know who's running it, you can just RM recursive. It just disappears. That's just it. You just do that. It is incredibly novel, but uh, surprisingly powerful. I mean, closing a network connection is just a matter of removing it. Um, this isn't necessarily a piece of software, but this is a piece of software suite that's built on top of Inferno that I like. It's called Octopus. Uh, it was made by this guy named Nemo. Uh, I like Nemo quite a lot. I've talked to him a few times. Um, it adds, you quote, ubiquitous access to computing resources. Uh, basically, the idea is, is it facilitates distributed computing uh, by connecting tons and tons and tons of supersets of Inferno together um, and then doing load balancing and distribution of responsibility. Uh, what sucks? The docs suck, but only kind of and only sometimes. Which is to say, uh, there's lots of sources of information. They might be outdated. They might be for some guy's fork of Inferno that he's maintained since last year. Uh, or it might just be for a corporation's internal version of it, which I've run into a few times, that they just don't share the source for it. So it's just not accurate, and there might be software reference that you just can't get. Um, however, uh, all the manuals are pretty reliable. Uh, the primary source branch isn't updated very frequently. It is stable, though. It's not like it's not updated and broken. It's just not updated because Forsyth has better things to do, I guess. Um, and there's lots of resources to make tasks easier that just don't exist because Alcatel Lucent said so. Um, because they sold this for million dollar licenses and people weren't allowed to share anything. Um, and they are forever beholden to their financial decisions. So what can you make? We kind of talked about that already. Uh, it can run as little as whatever that is. I think it's a megabit. I don't know. That's the notation. Lowercase i, capital M, capital B. Um, but, but, but that's as little as it can run it. Uh, you can get programs which are networked, concurrent, fast, secure, TM, uh, and portable. Uh, I say secure TM because one of the biggest uh, problems, and I was going to approach this at some point, but I haven't gotten around to it. Uh, if somebody wants to help, that'd be great. Uh, TLS 1.0 is the only TLS supported. Yikes. So that's a big yikes. Um, that, that, that sucks. However, TLS does exist, which is a big step up from TLS not existing. Uh, so updating it is not the end of the world. TLS 1 and SSL 3 are basically the same thing. Yeah. So, and SSL 3 is very different. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Would it be fun to look at? Yeah. No. Yeah. Feel free to break it. Feel free to submit patches. I will upstream them for purgatorio. I set patches. That never bite? Yeah. Uh, 24.58 kilobytes over a megabyte. There you go! So just a little tiny bit more than a megabyte. Still pretty impressive. You get a garbage collector in that. It's, that's, that's really <laughs> fucking fancy, I'll be honest. Um, can't get a garbage collector with one megabyte in Java. 
certainly can't run anything useful, <laughs> um, let alone get a fucking shell uh, and an entire TCP stack. Um, did you know that your SIM card runs Java? I believe you. Card. That's yeah. gross. <laughs> I could have lived the rest of my life. And you can push applications over the air to it, and they're only kind of signed. Only kind of signed? Yeah, <laughs> by your carrier. TM. Yeah, I'm sure their keys are very well locked away <laughs> and given access to the proper people. Certainly they would channels. not leave their private keys floating around on a pair of headphones that they sell to people in the real world, looking at you, Sennheiser, giving out their fucking master cert private key to headphones. <laughs> Put it on their headphones. You just you can mount the phones <laughs> and just get their key. It had to be redacted, except it's a problem because it's like a trusted cert. Um, so they're a trusted signing authority, except now everyone can be Sennheiser. Um, so uh, that's kind of a mess. Uh, don't do that. Um, but yeah, any tool can be recomposed in Inferno and then summarily run on any platform with identical behavior, uh, which is kind of underrated. Uh, Infer or Java, of course, tries to solve this problem. And originally, uh, Inferno was made to compete with Java at some capacity. Uh, since they kind of solve similar problems in very different ways, one having an operating system and one having whatever Java has on top of the JVM. Very icky stuff. Uh, in fact, you can run really old Java code, like Java 2 or 3, a really old Java code on the Inferno. There's like a little like transpiler for it or some garbage. It's really fancy. Uh, I got it to work once. <coughs> Acme Stack is an Acme standalone con complex. It's a port of Acme to Inferno that runs in Inferno, and when you run it, it starts Inferno, and the only thing it runs is Acme, and then gives you access to the host file system. So it lets you use the Acme editor on whatever OS you want without having to rewrite it or report it. It just needs to run Inferno, which is kind of nice. Um, and you just vendor a pre-compiled Inferno, and just strip it down to your desires. So you could have a .exe or .app file, depending on your platform, and that just calls a script that starts EMU in a very special way. <coughs> Uh, here's some notable resources. This is mostly for you to deal with with the corpus uh, of the slides after the fact. Um, these are some people, I don't know all of them. I know some of them, uh, but they might be useful. Uh, here's an archive of like the Inferno universe uh, that I attempted to compile. Uh, it is smaller than you think, um, but it includes web mirrors of a bunch of different blogs and PDFs of books and PDF of a book that may or may not um, be readily available on the web. Uh, suffice to say that uh, might be useful. Uh, dubiously legal. We'll take down if it turns out it's dubiously legal. I, I'm not a lawyer. Um, here's some references I use. Some of them are YouTube videos. Please watch at your leisure. Uh, and that's it. That's all I got. Questions, preguntas, concerns, criticisms. The other guy walked out right before I ended. Feel bad. What's up? The uh, so I'm reading something. Mm -hmm. about Inferno and Java's relation. Uh, I'm, I have two questions in regards to some of the things that I'm not familiar with on here. Uh, sure. JIT compilation as well as, um, I guess, memory to memory architecture as opposed to something being a stack machine. Right. Uh, so the JIT, what you referred to for the first point, yeah. JIT, yeah, well, that's just in time. Before, yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. Really know what um, that is essentially, <coughs> you, you think of it as your code isn't built until it's run. So you can think of it like lazy evaluation in a way. Um, which is to say you can have a pile of source and it's compiled just in time. Mm -hmm. Which is to say just in time to actually run. So, um, uh, just given that, I know that there likely are differences, but there seems to be a bit of a gray area between like an interpreted language or like a JIT right. compiled This language. is, yeah, so JIT is, it is compiled when it's run, but there can be stages to activity before and after that. In the case of an interpreted language, it is also in some ways compiled just in time. It, it just depends at what level that exists. So in the case of like this, um, what hap and, and differences with like, say, Python, right? Um, with the exception of C Python, we're not talking about that. Um, but Python itself, 
when you give it a script, there is a Python virtual machine that exists, technically, um, and it feeds the, the bytecode for the virtual machine, quote, quote, is more or less the script source you feed it. There's no greater stage of it. There's no meta script or bytecode for the script, right? The, the script is a script. It's text that the human wrote, and that's fed immediately into the machine, and that's executed. It is not necessarily compiled. In the case of C Python, I believe, what happens is it takes the script and it builds it to C, and then runs that with the hope that it runs faster. Um, eh, kind of. Uh, in the case of something like Java or Dis, uh, or Java or Limbo, I should say. Um, they build down to bytecode, and then the bytecode is what you feed into the virtual machine. And what happens in, in the case of Inferno is the disk virtual machine builds the bytecode again. I believe it actually just builds it down to C again, even, or, or not, well, like machine code, it skips the C step uh, and then runs that. And that's how it gets its performance gains. Um, so there is a two, there's like a two stage. There's the you build your source into bytecode, and then the bytecode gets built into machine code and run okay. at runtime. So that that second portion, the, it going into machine code, is what allows you right. to essentially pip install PyDot faster and then make my Python script run faster. Well, Py, Python doesn't really do JIT. Uh, there, and I've used something before. Uh, it's not. Anything I could be wrong. Uh, Somebody wants to correct me. I used it at the beginning of last semester. Uh, it, I, I had to add just some, it was really straightforward to use. I just added tags that said uh, add JIT. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's like how CPython will like, build it down and then run it. Okay. Yeah, so, so it probably just uses like CPython. In fact, I think CPython is like the standard distribution of Python nowadays. I'm not, I'm not really positive. Um, PyPy, yeah, that was the name of it. PyPy. Oh, okay. I don't PyPy is Python uh, written in Python. It's, it's a self hosted version of Python that does just in time compile Python, but the interpreter itself is written in Python. I see. What? Yeah, that makes sense, but it's self hosted. I'm, just, I'm trying to. Neat. Why, why is it done that way? Uh, it's got better performance. That's interesting. It's because the same optimizations that it can apply to, inter to the code that it's interpreting, it can apply to itself. So rather than having to go through an optimized Python interpreter, you just have to have one really good Python optimizer. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. There you go. Thank you. I don't That's know. my understanding of it. Like, circuit it three or four years ago was last time I went through Python. Okay. Yeah, C, uh, C Python, I think, might be different than Scython, which is the original kind of just in, in, uh, interpreted one that does mm. use bytecode, but that's those PyC files. Yeah. That just show up only for interpreted modules, and they're not really. It does compile it to bytecode, but it then interprets the bytecode old school. It there you go. Just in time compile. There you go. Okay. There's the answer. Thank you, Dreyfus. I don't use Python enough to know. <coughs> um, yeah, there's that. Uh, as for the uh, memory question, I'm not sure. Um, Moody was talking to me about how syscalls will essentially make temporary replications of themselves. And so if I type in ls, then uh, I'm sorry, your stack would temporarily. I'm, I'm really confused. Uh, last last night when you were recording me from. Uh, last night when you were talking about how a syscall would essentially duplicate. When you were talking about your 308 oh, extra credit. Oh, talking about fork? Yeah, yeah, I was talking yeah, about fork. fork. Yeah, fork. So oh, uh, is the um, is the <laughs> sentence the machine is a memory to memory architecture, not a stack machine, in reference to we're not using fork? No, no. I think I think what that means is that it, it it maps directly into the host memory. It doesn't like so. Inferno is running on the host. Yes. Inferno on the host has X has a stack, right? So the I, I again of a fixed size of a fixed size. So this is just me bullshitting based on what what it seems to be saying is that it, when Inferno runs programs, it's able to map those programs on Inferno directly to what the uh, in, the Inferno so stack is given under the host. There's actually, so there's actually a couple of exercises in this book, and if you do those exercises, it answers that question. And I did those exercises like a couple days ago. So what it basically is, is that uh, uh, disk bytecode that it compiles to, is, the disk virtual machine is modeled as a uh, memory to memory uh, architecture, which basically means that your opcodes, like an add opcode, will take three uh, addresses as, as arguments. Uh, two source operands and a destination operand. Um, now that's basically a memory-to-memory -memory architecture, which they say is modeled as a uh, as a uh, register machine with a mm. register-to-register -register model with an infinite number of registers. 
which is actually really easy to just in time compile to say a risk machine that has, say a RISC-V that has just 32 registers. Because what you're basically doing then is that your just in time compiler essentially has to just deal with allocating and shuffling around registers because you have this compiled disk byte code that you can really think of as binary language just for a, uh, a hypothetical machine that has an infinite number of registers. It, uh, the machine actually doesn't have any memory. It just has an infinite number of registers for these opcodes that operate from register to register, uh, which is essentially memory to memory, and then it's just in charge of your sort of managing virtual machine just-in-time compiler to see a chunk of code that needs 12 registers. If there's 12 free registers, it just renames those registers, compiles it down to code, and uses those 12 registers. Now, if, you, if there's only eight registers available because you've only got 32 rather than infinite registers, you kick four of them out, store those in memory, and then still compile your, basically convert, uh, you're really just translating your opcode from whatever the dis opcode is, and the dis memory references, which are basically register references in an infinite register machine, to whatever registers it's using of the finite register machine that it actually runs on. So basically Java, when they, when they say that Java is a stack machine, your Java opcode actually does everything, um, like if you're familiar with uh, Spark or MIPS, where you get like add R1, R2, R3. To add R1 and R2 and store the result in R3. Well, in Java bytecode, when you see an instruction, everything is done in terms of offsets from the stack pointer. That's what the opcodes are in Java bytecode. So you'll see an opcode that's add one word from the stack pointer, two words from the stack pointer, and store the result three words from the top of the stack pointer. Java, that works pretty well, especially when you're dealing with a deep call stack, because uh, all of your bytecode that's compiled there, uh, all of your functions, classes that are compiled to bytecode, just have to, it's all really portable, because they are only referencing variables in terms of, or memory in terms of distance from the stack pointer, which is great. And that also compiles pretty well to modern machines because, uh, especially like compiles to x86, great, because x86 has a bunch of opcodes and uh, addressing modes that are really good at addressing relative to the stack pointer. Um, this kind of more was uh, meant to target a RISC architecture that's a register to register architecture uh, without having any references to memory. So what I have looked at is does it actually use a stack? Because um, <laughs> it, it doesn't necessarily need to, especially if you're talking something really funky like on Spark. I, I want to I want to look at that code. I haven't had a chance yet. Because you've got your you know your limbo, which is compiled to disks. We can call it assembly with disk opcodes and disk operands, and the disk operands are basically it's just an infinite number of registers. Um, it uh, it numbers them. Uh, it does number them at offsets of four uh, because it uses native words, and I'm assuming that it, that's just to kind of keep things um, a little more sane compared to a real machine. Uh, and then when it goes to link it together, it's because it's an individual uh, execution unit. Each disk file is its own sort of compilation unit, it's its own execution context um, that it can basically allocate when a program loads, and when a program loads all of its constituent uh, components, it just needs a couple hundred registers, and then as code executes, when it's just in time compiled, your actual VM that's managing everything kind of can choose which registers to compile it to, and then, it, then your just in time compilation becomes really snappy uh, bytecode translation. So that's that's what I was looking at from it. Um, it's really neat to kind of think of that they, they write it so that if you look at it like opcodes, which are a lot more familiar in the 80s mostly, to see like a memory to memory um, instructions that philosophy, uh, I think Bax is heavily memory to memory, where you don't necessarily even have registers. You can just say, add these two memory addresses together and store the result in this memory address. You can still do that in x86, you're not supposed to, it's slow shit. Um, well, you do that, but you, uh, instead of thinking of, of uh, your memory to memory as actually memory to memory, it's an infinite register machine, which if you're running that virtual infinite register machine, it's really easy to implement that on top of a actual finite register machine because you're just allocating registers um, every time you do a just-in-time compilation. Okay, so uh, upon the first mention of um, you describing how Java is simply offsetting where it's going to store everything from its original reference one, that made a lot more sense, especially in regards to how you're connecting that with how portable it is. And yeah, and the memory-to-memory -memory is almost deceptive in that it actually emits memory, and it's more so like 
I think register to register would definitely be a much more transparent yeah. name for that. Infinite, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it, it essentially you're saying is something like a pure memory to memory mm. architecture that doesn't have registers is exactly the same thing as a register to register architecture with an infinite number of registers. <laughs> Um, so it's done as a memory-to-memory -memory architecture with no registers, but it's kind of implemented and optimized uh, as a register-to-register -register with infinite registers because it's a lot easier to map that to a machine with a finite number of registers. So you're just taking registers out and swapping them in. And when you get like a new function frame, like a new stack frame that enters, well, that's just a new allocation of registers because that new stack frame has its own set of infinite of registers in the infinite register machine or the memory to memory machine. Um, but you just take out the old ones and bring in new registers and allocate new registers, which what's the easiest way to do that on your implementation host machine? Just use a stack. And and you wind up with your traditional stack frame building up. But whereas Java is uh, everything explicitly references the stack and all of your operations are done on variables uh, based on where they live relative to the top of the stack with Dis, it's they're all just uh, abs you absolute memory addresses or or uh, registers in an infinite register machine. Okay. Yeah. And I cleared up a ton. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's what we see. That was really good. <laughs> There's a uh, there, you can find I think it's like at the end of chapter two where you are literally going through um, because uh, when you can use limbo with a dash s flag and it'll spit out just like uh, GCC with a dash s flag it'll spit out the dis uh, assembly rather than generating uh, a .dis bytecode file. Um, I don't know a way to do that with Java. You probably can. Um, but yeah, you can just basically, uh, there's probably some way to use uh, Limbo equivalent of Ops jump too. But yeah, there's just a couple exercises where you go in like adding variables and loading modules and whatnot and kind of seeing what happens uh, to how your registers uh, registers coming.